am going to do another one of my pop culture road shows because I was going through some of the things that I sold today. Uh, I collect and sell items from the pop culture items, retro items, toys, books, games from the 50s through the 90s. And then I do this show to try and find out a little more something about them just so I can gain more useless knowledge that oddly enough helps what I do. It's so funny, like this useless knowledge that I've always had is finally being put to use to actually make money. Never, it, it was always something like, what, what good is that gonna do me? Well now, the fact that I can, you know, uh, know these things when I collect stuff go, that is why it's useful. So this is a vintage Herman Eichhorn block puzzle. Uh, they started around 19, 49, I believe. Block puzzles were a thing that they started making where they originally were wooden blocks that they would uh, make where they were just different colors. And you would shift the puzzles around. There are those travel games where there's the puzzle where there's one piece missing and you would have to shift them around to try and get the area that they're supposed to go. So you'd have to kind of alter stuff. I love that a train is going by right now while I'm doing this. We've been hearing a train horn honking this whole time. And I'm like, is it coming? Is it going? The horn has been honking. And then it finally stopped honking. And I was like, great, I can go. It's because it's coming by now. Anyway, back to where I was. The wooden block puzzle, you would do this sort of thing, right? And then printing became uh, available for the blocks and at first it wasn't very good and then uh, Herman Eichhorn decided to do full colored printing onto these wooden blocks. So what you would essentially have is six sides so you could do six different puzzles, right? And you would take them out, mess up the blocks and then put them in order. And each one would come with a guide that would show you what each, oh, that's the same one. That's funny. I got a double print in there. Uh, which each side of the puzzles would be if you put them together and they were fairly elaborate. So it was still somewhat difficult to do. And these were all the ones, and a lot of them they said would uh, be more adult themed or Grimm's fairy tale. Adult theme meaning that um, kids would find them boring, not like sexual. They, <laughs> they were, they were uh, just ones where like kids were kind of bored with what some of the actual things were and then they did fairy tale themes and that interested them more. Then later on, they actually then went into other wood, or wood based toys and he made a train set which if you've ever had a wooden train set or like a preschool train set, the kind with the tracks where they interlock, like it's it's kind of got like a jigsaw puzzly end and you can connect them. They made the first one of those and they still make them to this day. And they're, that's what they're known for is these wooden trains because they weren't stiff. You could actually, they had a little bit of give. So when you could have them go around corners, they could kind of not have to do the exact corner. You could bend and move them a little bit. So they did those and those were actually more successful and puzzles really were better as jigsaw puzzles. Like puzzles like this are even more fun. Sorry, I just sold this today too. It's a Mary Poppins tray puzzle. Like some of the shapes are they would cut it into a bird or they would cut it into a cat and then I feel like they do those first and then they make random shapes around it so they can try and fill in the gaps. But anyway, that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about what I learned about Herman Eichhorn wooden block puzzles. Raccoon Mario. So this is a figure that I have from, let's see, it is from 1989 and it is Raccoon Mario. Now the reason it's raccoon is because you'll see that he has ears. He has a raccoon tail and Apparently, in one of the games, uh, actually Super Mario Brothers 3, uh, it is a form of Mario he turns into after acquiring the Super Leaf. And 
acquiring the super leaf uh, is what makes him form into this. And because of the tail, he can slowly fall down when he falls off of something and attack enemies with his tail by spinning. Whoopsh, whoopsh. That's right, I'm making sound effects. So there's that. So that's what I learned about Raccoon Mario. But then I also realized there's a version of Mario that is full on wearing like what looks like a raccoon costume instead of just having ears and a tail. And that one is actually called Tanuki Mario. Now, what I found out about that, and it's Mario, he's got the ears and tail, everything else, just his face is sticking out. And it was attained by donning the Tanuki suit and gave the abilities of Raccoon Mario, which it is often confused with, but it added statue transformation. I don't know what statue transformation means, but this form comes from the uh, Tanuki, an animal found in Japan and often depicted in folklore. And the other thing too is I found out that when they, when they first put the Tanuki Mario in the game, the person who made it basically said that they knew that it would confuse people outside of Japan, like, because nobody would know what it was, but he was excited, he was so excited to do a Tanuki version, a Tanuki suit in the game that he kept it and kind of said, I don't care if it confuses people because I think that it's awesome that we put it in this game. So that's why it stayed in there. And then also I was kind of, while I was looking at this, I saw a lot of the usual Mario drawings that you see when you look at Mario stuff. And I was like, who did the original drawings for this? Why? Because I really like the way they're drawn. So like when they first introduced Mario, who was the person that drew it? Yoichi Kitobe. So he was an animator. Uh, he was uh, actually hired by Nintendo because of the work he did. He worked for Toy Animation, which uh, is a Japanese animation company. And he was an animator on productions such as Prince of the Sun, Panda Go, and Heidi Girl of the Alps. He also uh, worked as the art supervisor on Pokemon games. But I just really like his drawing style, so I wanted to look up who it was. And right now, he's apparently a freelance. He doesn't work for Mar or, uh, Nintendo anymore. He's a freelance artist. So that was the type of rabbit hole stuff that I uh, went down looking for uh, Raccoon Mario. <laughs> this one was a fun discovery. This stuff that I didn't realize that I even learned that I had some of this related to it. So I sell a lot of R.L. Stein books and right here is R.L. Stein's Ghosts of Fear Street. Now I'm familiar with Goosebumps, I'm familiar with R.L. Stein, and he has a lot of different series and I find R.L. Stein books and I'm like, well, what prompted these other series? So I looked up Ghosts of Fear Street. Now this is a book that he only wrote for like two years, or book series that he only wrote for two years, technically. R.L. Stein wrote a series that was called Fear Street, which happened to be stories that happened on a street that was called Fear Street to a set of people that lived there, things like that. Usual R.L. Stein stuff. And it was meant for more mid-teen aged people. And then what he wanted to do was create a series for younger kids like Goosebumps, which is supposed to be more for like 10 to 12 year olds, 10 to 13 year olds. So he did Ghosts of Fear Street. The thing I love about that is this version being for the younger kids, it's kind of like saying, it's like Muppet Babies. It's like, this is the baby version of Fear Street. You know, Ghosts of Fear Street kids. But that's what Ghosts of Fear Street is. The funny thing is, is he actually didn't write any of these books. They were ha ghost written by uh, other people. So he, this whole series of books actually wasn't by R.L. Stein, but it was based on his characters and stories from Fear Street. And then while I was looking it up, I saw that he did other types of books. He actually started out in comedy and then he wrote like teen drama stuff, which that I knew because I have this book which is called Phone Calls. And it's essentially about uh, teens calling each other on the phone and they're talking about homecoming. He's also got another series that's called like Cheerleaders and it's just, it's more of a teens going through teen stuff type books. 
and I had one of these. This I knew about. So that was no surprise to me. The thing that was surprising to me is I wanted to know how did R.L. Stein start out? Now, there used to be these magazines that Scholastic would put out when I was a kid, and they were magazines like Dynamite and Bananas and uh, Super Mag. They were essentially, we didn't have the internet, and People Magazine wouldn't write stories where kids liked them or had activities. So they were like activity books, but interviews with TV personalities for shows that we watched, and occasionally they would have jokes and things like that. Well, R.L. Stein started out working for Bananas, which was put up by Scholastic, and it was one of those magazines, and he would write a joke section where people would draw illustrations. He was uh, going under the name Jovial Bob Stein, which I never put that together because I collect these old joke books from the 70s and 80s, and the name that's always been on it is Jovial Bob Stein, and it R. Robert L. Stein. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, holy crap, I've been, I've been selling these and collecting them, and I, it never occurred to me that R.L. Stein wrote these, like, these are really bad, like, groaner-type 70s joke books about, like, like here's one. Sister, uh-oh, Dad's really going to be mad when he sees the big hole you dug in the front yard. What are you going to do with all that dirt? Brother, don't worry about it. I'm going to dig another big hole and bury it all. These are the types of jokes he wrote. Can I share your sled? Sure. We'll go half and half. Thanks. I'll have it for downhill and you can have it for uphill. These types of jokes. That was that was R.L. Stein. I, I had more of these. I've actually sold a few. And now I'm wondering, like, should I be mentioning that when I sell them? Uh, I mean, it's not like I'm going to sell them for any more than they are. But I just found that really funny that he wrote horrible jokes. And that's how he started out. So that's what I learned about R.L. Stein looking that up. And this one was a total surprise to me. I was kind of excited about that. To end it all, I have nothing I found about this. I have no new information about it. I just have this. It's a wooden pig with dangly limbs sculpture. I just wanted to let you know that because I sold this. People ask me about it all the time. And it's this. And I know nothing about it. But it's fascinating. Just a wooden clump to make it look like a pig. All right, that's all I got for today. Uh, I was pretty I was pretty psyched about what I learned there. So hope you enjoyed it. That's my pop culture roadshow for today.